There's lots of players coming up the space trying to chip away at different parts of the ecosystem. We're laser focused on a very particular one, which is middle Americans who have strong income, decent quality credit, but they've got a lot of debt. And what do they need? They need someone to help them lower the cost of their debt so that they can begin to build up savings. Hi everyone, it's Julie Rahage Greenberg here with your Tux Time podcast from FinTech Today where we talk about all things FinTech. In this episode, I am joined by Scott Sanborn, the CEO of Lending Club, which Scott, I, I would be remiss if we did not start this podcast talking about the tear that your stock has been on lately. I, I asked our Slack community uh, what questions they have for you and there was one person that was like, honestly, just thank him because it's the best performing stock in my portfolio right now. <laughs> so you know, let's dive into that a little bit. What, what do you think has been behind it? Because for those that don't know, your sco- stock was not doing that well for a very long time as well. It's quite the turnaround story. Yeah, yeah. I, we like to say, Julie, that it's overnight success, three years in the making. Um, and, you know, what what you're seeing is we've now, for the second quarter in a row, really a beat on all uh, financial metrics, all expectations. And it's, it's a couple of things. Um, one is we recently announced the acquisition of a digital bank, Radius Bank which uh, does a lot to change the economics of the business. We've eliminated some very, very significant expenses and we've added uh, new revenue streams while pretty much doing the same activity we've always been doing. So in our, in our recent earnings deck, we showed how, you know, doing the same rough amount of loan volume, we generated uh, this quarter uh, about 57 more million in revenue and 27 million more in profit from doing the same amount of loan volume. So that's one. And then the second thing is we had gone through a pretty uh, deep zero-based budgeting exercise in 2018 and 19 to really transform the cost structure of the business. We relocated a bunch of employees to lower cost locations. We automated a bunch of processes. And we never got to show the market the effect of that because just as we were finishing all of that activity, COVID hit. And um, so kind of we came out of COVID with the acquisition of the bank and the cost structure in place. And so that's your, that's really what you're seeing. Higher revenue, lower expenses. Uh, those, those two things, you know, come together in a nice way. Why, why did you decide to do the acquisition when you did? And, you know, looking back at it now that we are about, you know, a year or two um, uh from that moment, do you think it was the right time or do you think you should have done it sooner or later? Um, yeah, so I guess two questions in there. You know, why did we decide to do it? There there were so many reasons um, that, you know, you can pick any one or two and they, I think they would have been sufficient to, to cause you to make this strategic decision. You know, I talked a little bit about financials. You know, we eliminated the cost that we used to pay to issuing banks to make loans for us. We eliminated the cost of warehouse lines and we added a new revenue stream, which is interest income. That's the financial piece. There, there's also a very uh, significant strategic piece, which is we now have the ability to just do more for our customers, right? Not only help them with lending, but also help them with spending and savings. Um, and so having the ability to offer banking services and be vertically integrated to do that in a way that, again, allows us to kind of capture more value and also therefore share more value to the customers is, is another big one. In terms of the timing, um, you know, you have to be ready and you don't just decide to be a bank. It's you know, actually not your decision. It's the government's decision. And, you know, you, you're, you're taking on a pretty awesome responsibility, which is, among other things, you are the caretaker for your customers' savings. And um, you know, it's not something you can, it's not, you can't be in a state of readiness with that kind of c- compliance and control infrastructure overnight. We had done quite a bit of the work because we worked with banks you know, in our old model, we, you know, we identify borrowers, we assess credit risk, we underwrite it, price it. Uh, it used to be that a bank would issue it, now we issue it, uh, and we service it. 
the the banks would buy about half of the loan volume. You know, we we didn't keep any of the loan volume. We sold it all to a broad ecosystem of, of loan investors, asset managers, banks, uh, even hedge funds. And so, because banks were buying loans from us, they would uh, require us to meet a lot of their same standards. So we had to have bank quality standards around you know your customer, BSA AML, fair lending, all of those pieces. So we started to accumulate some of the cost basis for effectively being a bank, but we weren't getting the benefit of it, right? We were, uh, and so that's kind of what pushed us. Would I have liked to have done it earlier? I mean, a lot of things had to come together, right? You, uh, we needed to be ready and um, the, the market conditions needed to be ripe. We had been going down the path of a de novo application, right? Which is start a bank from scratch, follow an application process. That process, you know, there's not very many examples you can point to of non-banks becoming a bank through that de novo process. And where you've seen it, it has taken many years. I Mm -hmm. think in the case of Aro, they talked about it costing them north of $100 million and taking them more than three years to to accomplish. We were prepared for that, but then, you know, we met the folks at Radius and we saw that we kind of solved the lending side of the equation uh, and they had built a great digital banking experience. So they had the deposit side of the equation. We said, wait, these two institutions would just be so much better off together. And so, and you know, in order for that to work, they needed to be available to, to <laughs> engage in that conversation at a price that we could afford. Uh, and so that's, that's kind of what drove the timing was just um, you know, that uh, interaction. Yeah, and one thing that I, you know, I'm looking at your earnings, which you guys announced about a week ago, and in the last two quarters alone, you guys have generated almost half a billion dollars worth of revenue just from holding some of those loans on your balance sheet and making interest income. So, I mean, it's made a huge difference on, um, you know, how what the earnings profile and what the company actually looks like. Do you think that? now with your valuation that the market is starting to understand that or no and i i just ask because while it has gone up a ton it's still pretty cheap looking compared to some companies like upstart sofi and others that are out there trading north of the five billion dollar valuation that you guys are at yeah i mean you, you're correct you're starting to see and it's really still early innings because as you add loans to your balance sheet it takes time for that income stream to build. So it's just starting to build now, but you can just look at the quarterly numbers and you see, you know, quarter after quarter after quarter, it's getting, uh, it's getting uh, bigger. Uh, and it grew significantly uh, from Q2 to Q3. So that, that'll continue to build. The other thing that's happening um, that I think we underappreciated uh, when we were going into this is we do also feel that in many ways it unlocks our ability to innovate. The, one of the challenges with lending is when you want to enter a new category and you don't have a track record and you need to convince other people to buy the loans that you have limited experience in making or no experience in making, that's hard, right? That's hard to start. And we experienced that with auto. And what we're seeing now is we've said, okay, we have high conviction that we know what we're doing. We've actually been making these loans for several years. We'll take them ourselves. As soon as we said, we'll take them ourselves, Guess what? All the banks showed up and said, oh, wait, we, uh, you guys are going to buy them. Well, if you guys are buying them, we have a lot more confidence in the, in, in the quality and that you guys will be good stewards of credit. And we also, they also have confidence because of the fact that we're a bank and held to the same standards that they are, that, that uh, increases uh, confidence because they're required by law to treat their partners as an extension of themselves. So, so yeah, you are just starting to see the benefits and we, uh, and it, the ones we expected and additional ones, you know, in terms of value, you know, I don't, uh, I, the way I look at it right now is I, I, I do think the market is just starting to see what we're creating. We're only a few quarters in, that was our second full quarter as a bank. And you got investors coming at it from two sides, right? You have the, what's called the traditional finance investors, bank analysts and bank investors. And to them, we're this unique creature because, wow, we're not, you know, we're banks are struggling, as I'm sure you know, to show loan growth. Well, uh, 
we're not struggling. <laughs> we're not struggling to show loan growth and, and, and or revenue growth or or margin expansion. So we're a unique animal for them. Very high growth, and it, you know the majority of our revenue is fee based revenue. It's marketplace revenue. It's not. It's not from loans we hold. It's from loans we're selling. So all of that is a different dimension, and we don't fit squarely into a traditional spreadsheet, right? You've got to create a custom model for lending club. Same thing is true on the other side of the house, which is the tech analysts. And, you know, there's a lot that's familiar to them in terms of the growth rate and the TAM and our acquisition costs and the efficiency with which, you know, we're driving loan automation and, and, and origination and servicing. But they have to get their heads around, you know, interest rate income and fluctuations in rates and those other pieces. So it is an education process that we're engaged in, and I, you know, we feel like we're making uh, quite good progress there. But you know, still, still more to do. And you know, in the meanwhile, we're mostly just focused on delivering the business results and making sure we're being clear uh, to um, you know the rest of the market where where we're trying to take this. How has the acquisition changed what you're, you know, focused on with the business? Because as we've established, there's a ton of things that it, it changes for the model and whatnot. So, you know, pre-acquisition and post-acquisition, where where's your focus right now and making sure that you're returning that shareholder value and and really innovating still? Yeah, so the big, uh, you know, the, the first thing we wanted to do post-acquisition, uh, in addition to obviously successfully completing the integration was ramping up our lending volume, starting with the personal loan category. That's where we're the market leader. That's the bulk of our revenue. So, you know, pull that into the bank so that we can issue it uh, ourselves. Then uh, in the next quarter, uh, this last quarter, we did the same thing for auto. And we talked about we're already seeing the benefits uh, there. It was our uh, largest quarter of loan issuance in auto uh, last quarter. Next quarter, we're going to pull in the final lending business that we've got uh, stood up, which is our buy now, pay later business in um, the elective medical space. So that is fertility treatments, you know, braces for your kids, big purchases that um, that is not are not covered by your insurance. So once we've done that, we've kind of brought into house the, the revenue drivers, the earnings drivers of the bank. And we've gotten these things on a common platform, so that which which was not the case before, so that all of our investments in our you know, data science platform, our decisioning infrastructure, our payment infrastructure can be leveraged across all of those businesses. You know, and then we're going to be turning our attention to uh, the banking side of the house, which is okay. How do we take a customer that we helped save money off of their credit card debt or save money off of their auto loan? and help them manage their broader spending and, and their savings. Switching gears, um, just since crypto has been such a big thing lately, what do, you, what do you make of this whole DeFi space versus the TradFi or however you would say that and whatnot? Like how is Lending Club thinking about the evolution of the banking system in terms of you know, crypto and decentralization? Yeah, so for, so for us, we're staying very, you know, very, very focused on who our core customer is. And, you know, there's, as I'm sure you know, there's lots of players coming at the space, trying to chip away at different parts of the ecosystem, serve different segments of the customer base. We're laser focused on a very particular one, which is, let's call it uh, middle Americans who have strong income, they've got, you know, decent quality credit, but they've got a lot of debt. Over-index on credit card debt, auto loan debt, student debt. We're really focused on them. And what do they need? They need someone to help them lower the cost of their debt so that they can begin to build up savings. Um, and so our vertically integrated bank model, because we control the whole stack and we're not sharing, you know, we're not sharing interchange fee, we're not sharing... Um, you know, we're not sharing issuance fees with an issuing bank. We think staying vertically integrated, no branch, well, one branch, we have, we have one branch, uh, no branches, allows us to deliver that saving. So for us, um, let's call, uh, you know, crypto as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an investment. I'd say it's not the right thing for our customer base at this point in our evolution, right? If you've got a credit card, if you got 25 grand in credit card debt 
at a 21% interest rate, the thing you should be doing with your spare cash is not you know, a speculative asset. What you should be investing in is paying down your credit card debt because you are certain to earn a 21% return by <laughs> lowering, lowering that debt. Um, so that that's so in our evolution, it'll be let's ha- let's get the lending solutions in place, connect it to banking and create an ecosystem where we can start to say, hey, Julie, looks like, you know, we're approved. We, we can approve you to save you $80 a month on your car loan. Do you want us to s- lower your payment by $80 or do you want us to lower your payment by 40? And we'll take the other 40. We'll put it in a savings account for you. And when your loan is paid off, you're going to have, you know, over four thousand dollars in savings. And then you won't need to use your credit card next time an emergency happens. Or, hey, Julie, why don't you let us put a personal loan into a lending club checking account? When you use your debit card, we're going to reward you for using money you have instead of reward you for going into debt. Every time you use your debit card, we'll give you 1% cash back to pay down your, your debt, to pay down your loan. So that's the way we'll reward you. So we're focused on kind of getting that ecosystem going, which will be a you know, a multi-year journey before we, you know, lift our heads up and say, let's get people to lower the cost of their debt, uh, even out their cash flow, get on a path of having savings. And yeah, then it would come to investing. That's for, let's call it crypto. In terms of the broader applications of the blockchain, we're, you know, we are as interested as, as everybody else in seeing how it can um, unlock value for consumers and payments and, you know, reduce let's call it middleman costs and other parts of the you know, securitizations or other parts of the value chain but that's not that's not what we're focused on so other than um buying radius did any other part of the business change operationally not uh no not significantly so they're you know their core uh their their core deposit they have they had a great award-winning checking account which we will, as I mentioned, next year kind of integrate into the platform so that, you know, it can integrate with the customer data and the lending products and all the rest. Um, and then they've got some commercial businesses uh, that we are maintaining. Uh, one of them, you know, one of the larger ones is the SBA loans, the government guaranteed loans. So they were a big provider of uh, um PPL loans during the pandemic, and you know those are nice businesses. They diversify the risk on the balance sheet, and so we're we're maintaining those. Okay, I'm gonna read a tweet off to you, and I had already booked this podcast with you after Charlie Ma wrote a really good piece for us, and it I hadn't even noticed how crazy your stock had gone over the past couple of years, and he pointed it out, and I was like, you know, we we should talk to Scott on the podcast and see what's going on here. Um, but my friend Bruno from Plaid put out a tweet shortly after reading Charlie's piece that said, Lending's club turnaround is one of the least told fintech success stories of the year so far. Too early to tell, but with Radius Bank plus Capital Markets Access plus 10 or more years of personal loan data, Lending Club is in a pole position for embedded lending play, right? Do you agree with that or no? I do agree with that. Well said. (laughs) <laughs> do you have anything to add to that? And why do you think that, you know, what he said is so important? Well, look, I mean, we feel like, um, you know, we, we were one of the first generations, right? We went public in 2015. Uh, we had the largest uh, tech IPO of the year at the time. And then, you know, uh, we had some struggles. Uh, and when you have some struggles, it's easy to uh, slip from view, and we've spent the last several years really rebuilding, uh, you know, restoring loan investor confidence, re- re- restoring shareholder confidence, and kind of quietly transforming the, the overall business model. Both, you know, something we didn't talk about is, um, you know, we completely overhauled our expense base. We had a two-year project where we moved people out of San Francisco, renegotiated vendor contracts. You know, got up today, we're at 80% of our loans are fully automated, like we automated all our processes. So we were working on that in addition to getting ready for the bank. And so now you're just seeing those pieces come together. And, I, you know, I think the, the market reaction is partly driven by the fact that we had gone off the radar and we're now back on the radar. And, and there's also some publicly available comps, as you noted, to, to look at where you say, okay, Let's on the merits, revenue growth, marketing acquisition costs, profit margin, 
let's compare some of these companies and, and Lending Club compares favorably. If I was to have you on the podcast a year from now, what, what would we be talking about? Well, a year from now, I would love to be talking about the fact that, you know, we've moved, we, we've successfully taken our lending wedge, which is allowing us to efficiently acquire really satisfied customers at scale. Um, and we've turned it into a broader relationship, right? And we've moved from, let's call it a more episodic relationship. You know, our customers do love us. They come back, but, you know, 50% of them come back within five years because they need another form of credit. How do we turn that into a broader relationship? That's what I'd love to be talking about in a year. And the success in that is, like I said, once we get these lending products into the banking platform, it will be clicking in the banking product and creating the infrastructure that allows us to do that, right? The, the, the data infrastructure that allows us to recognize what is the value that each customer needs from us at a given point in time. It could be a lending product it could just be nudges like, hey, your your payroll date just changed. You should change your mortgage date because otherwise, you know, you're, you, it's too far away from when you get paid. Let's make sure you have these things aligned. So that's that's what we're going to be building next year and, and beyond. It sounds so simple and whatnot and great. What's going to be the biggest challenge in actually making that reality come to life? Is it going to be getting the tech right? Is it going to be hiring the right people? Is it going to be something regulatory? Like what, what's going to be that? All of those things are correct. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we feel, we feel very good about our starting position, right? We're, you know, we have a, a we believe a, a business model that can deliver durable growth and in, in revenue and earnings. Um, and we've got a, a very engaged employee base who's been committed through, you know, the, the more troubling days through the pandemic. And so our employee engagement scores now are record high. We're not suffering the great resignation that, you know, I'm, I'm hearing about everywhere. But, you know, this is a the transformation is just getting started. Right. The bank is what's going to provide the fuel. As we said in our last earnings call, we're going to be investing in building the loan portfolio because that will drive future earnings. We're going to be investing in marketing and we're going to be investing in technology. So in order to move from a more transactional relationship to a, you know, a, a, a full on, you know, continuously underwritten customer relationship, lots of work needs to go into the, the data infrastructure and even into the interaction model with the consumer. We've got to move from what's primarily been a desktop to a, to a mobile experience. Um, we are uh, transitioning um, the, the rest of our platform to the cloud. So we have a lot of work to do. We gotta hire the team, execute on it, and do it in a way that um, you know uh, continues to make the regulators comfortable that we're managing all of our risks. Uh, that said, I'd say myself and the rest of the team are really fired up to go do it. and feel really well positioned because we feel like we've actually tackled the harder part of the banking equation, which is, you know, how do you give somebody money and have them pay you back? Well, that is a fantastic spot to leave on. We'll definitely have to have you back in a year and see how things are going, how else the Radius Bank transition, um, you know, has transformed the business, other things that you guys have added. But thank you so much for taking time to talk to us today. If you guys want to find out more about Lending Club or anything else that's going on in fintech, go to fintechtoday.co, sign up for our newsletter, and we'll keep tabs on everything for you. Otherwise, Scott, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me, Julie.